Hi, I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. The title of this mechanisms video is the role of succinic acid dehydrogenase in mitochondrial function. So this video is sponsored by Integrated Medicine Academy. Integrated Medicine Academy is an online academy of courses, what we call mastery courses in different topics of integrated medicine. For more information about our various courses, you can go to integratedmedicineacademy.com, or you can also email us if you have any questions at integratedmedicineacademy at gmail.com. Here is our video disclaimer, understanding that this is for educational purposes only. And so let's go ahead and begin the talk. I need to put my glasses on here. So succinic acid is a very important compound. If you do organic acid testing, you'll often find a lot of individuals are elevated for succinic acid on that particular test. Now, it's technically what's called a dicarboxylic acid. So a carboxylic acid has a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with a hydroxyl group. So there's two of those. And this is a central part of the Krebs cycle, which exists within the mitochondria. Now, the enzyme that is linked to succinic acid is called succinic acid dehydrogenase. And it's interesting because it's linked to the Krebs cycle, but also to complex two of the electron transport chain. So if we look at the Krebs cycle, also called the citric acid cycle, we can see right down here is succinic dehydrogenase or succinic acid dehydrogenase. It's also called succinate dehydrogenase. So what it does is it converts succinic acid to fumaric acid, or if it's the base, conjugate base, it would be succinate to fumarate. The key point is that this enzyme is actually linked to the electron transport chain as well. And where it links up is at complex two. So we have four complexes that make up the electron tra transport chain. And then we have what's called an ATP synthase. Sometimes this gets called complex five, but technically four complexes plus an ATP synthase. And all of these things make a functional unit as part of the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. So we can see here that succinate or succinic acid dehydrogenase is linked to complex two. And it's important because it is a central place of the funneling of electrons that are moving from one complex to the next. Ultimately, with the end goal is to reduce oxygen to water. And when that's happening, when we're getting electron flow from one complex to the next, we're also getting an outward flow of protons or a positive charge hydrogen ion. And that gets pumped into the inner membrane space. And ultimately these protons or hydrogen ions accumulate over top the ATP synthase uh, complex or this pumping mechanism. And then these positive charges will eventually flow back into the matrix of the mitochondria, and that causes a rotation of these oval-shaped proteins down here, bringing together adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate to make ATP. So the whole point of the electron transport chain in part is to transport electrons from one complex to the next to reduce water, excuse me, oxygen to water, at the same time we're out pumping protons into the inner membrane space to cause the formation of ATP. And so succinic dehydrogenase is critically important linked to complex two. Now, I mentioned before that on the organic acid test, it doesn't matter which organic acid test you use, generally all of them will have a succinic acid or a succinate marker or compound, at least they should. And it's often elevated in people, and there's a number of reasons for this. So some causes of high succinic acid can be a dysfunction in the succinic acid dehydrogenase enzyme itself. Now that could occur because of environmental exposures. There could be heavy metals, so organophosphates, Glyphosate, for example, is known to interfere with succinate dehydrogenase, heavy metals, as I mentioned before. There could be genetic factors that are affecting the function of the enzyme. Uh, 
And interestingly, something called malonic acid, which is linked to an inborn error of metabolism, is also an inhibitor of succinate dehydrogenase. And it's not a common manifestation on an organic acid test, but from time to time, you will see elevations of malonic, uh, particularly in children. So the thing about complex two is it is a complex complex. What I mean by that is there's a number of different protein subunits. So it consists actually of four protein subunits, and it's the only complex of the electron transport chain that does not pump protons into the intermembrane space. So if you think about that, complex one, three, and four can, but complex two does not. So what it's doing is it's transferring electrons from succinate to CoQ10, specifically what's called the flavin adenine dinucleotide mechanism. So there's uh, flavin adenine dinucleotide is linked to riboflavin or vitamin B2, which plays a, a central role. So essentially what we're doing is we're transferring electrons that we're obtaining from food substrate and passing those electrons through a series of chemical reactions in each of these complexes, but complex two, for the eventual reduction of oxygen to water. Now, this was a fascinating article, Succinate Dehydrogenase Complex. It came out in 2018, and it gets very technical with regards to its description of the function of succinate dehydrogenase. But as you can see here, we have a link, right? So here's our citric acid cycle, also called our Krebs cycle. And it's converting succinate to fumarate. But at the same time, it's passing electrons through these different chemicals. We have FAD to FADH. We have what are called iron sulfur clusters that are part of the transferring mechanism. And then embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane is ubiquinone, which is the oxidized form of CoQ10, and ubiquinol, which is the reduced form. So we're moving electrons through these different chemical reactions, passing those electrons to eventually reduce CoQ10 to ubiquinol, the reduced form, so that it can then further transfer those electrons throughout the different complexes. So the big picture with regards to succinate dehydrogenase is that it's passing electrons through a vitamin B2 associated chemical, the flavin adenine dinucleotide. It passes those electrons through iron sulfur clusters eventually to CoQ10. There's no protons that are actually pumped into the intermembrane space. And then there are different components of the succinic dehydrogenase. So if you keep in mind, the succinic dehydrogenase is not just an enzyme, meaning one thing, it's actually a complex of multiple protein units. And each of those protein units is controlled by genetics. So interestingly, the complex two has to receive all of its information from nuclear DNA. Some of the complexes of the electron transport chain, about 13 proteins specifically, actually come from mitochondrial DNA. But all of the DNA that, that influence and build the structural unit of the complex, of the succinic dehydrogenase complex, actually comes from nuclear DNA. And so it is possible to have defects in any one of the protein subunits that would therefore affect the function of the enzyme. Okay, so again, we have the Krebs cycle here, also called citric acid cycle, and then we have these four protein subunits that make up the succinic dehydrogenase complex. And they're getting electrons from succinate and passing them through different protein subunits, eventually passing them through our iron sulfur clusters, passing them from ubiquinone to ubiquinol, and then that transfers those electrons downstream from there into complex three and complex four. So something that affects these different protein subunits, even things that could affect these iron sulfur clusters will eventually affect complex two.
all right and it's all about passing these electrons off into complex three so a succinic dehydrogenase dysfunction is really a dysfunction in the complex itself but it could be occurring at multiple areas now there are various forms of succinic dehydrogenase deficiency states that are actually associated with different types of cancers like paraganglioma, uh, pheochromocytoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, renal cell carcinoma, and others. So keep that in mind. That doesn't mean that if you do an organic acid test and find an elevation of succinic, acid, of succinic on that test that somebody has cancer, but elevations of succinic indicate some type of dysfunction is happening in that succinic acid dehydrogenase complex. Now, there are several models that have been proposed to explain a Krebs cycle dysfunction that is linked to a succinic dehydrogenase deficiency leading to tumor development. So for example, a decrease in what's called apoptosis. And this is where the cells are deficient in complex activity that have an influence on apoptotic signaling. So basically, there are intrinsic mechanisms that will tell the cell we're in danger, let's take ourselves out of circulation. Well, that can be disrupted, meaning that if you lose your apoptotic mechanism, that cell can no longer remove itself and it has the potential to become a cancer cell. Dysfunction in the complex can lead to increased reactive oxygen species. This can then lead to oxidative stress, further damage of the mitochondria. And then there's also something called a pseudo hypoxia pathway, where we get a loss of mitochondrial, mitochondrial tumor suppression genes that contribute to what's called pseudo hypoxia. And this can activate something called HIF1 alpha, hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha. So we often think of the mitochondria as the energy factories of the cells, and they clearly are, but they play a bigger role than just the production of ATP. They, many of the compounds that are linked to the Krebs cycle, for example, as well as the electron transport chain, but the Krebs cycle in this particular slide have an influence on overall function within the cell. So for example, you can see succinate, even fumarate, for example, can induce hypoxia inducible factor one alpha, hypoxia inducible one, uh, hypoxia inducible factor alpha can interact with the nucleus of the cell that can increase metabolism, erythropoiesis, angiogenesis, and even tumor invasion in a tumorigenic state. Now, at the same time, elevated succinate can inhibit the breakdown of hypoxia inducible factor alpha. So elevations of succinate could be associated with certain states of cancer, but again, it's not a definitive of that just based on one particular test, but it's important to understand that. But more importantly, it's, it's important just to understand that elevations of succinate are occurring because of some type of dysfunction within the succinate dehydrogenase complex. Now, if we take this to actually do a even a deeper level, and you, we start looking at cellular metabolism across the board, there's something called the Warburg effect. And the Warburg effect, which is also called aerobic glycolysis, is a phenomenon that occurs in cancer cells. So for example, glucose gets taken into a cell, it's trans, uh, uh, transferred through glycolysis or metabolized through glycolysis, I should say, and it creates pyruvate. Now pyruvate can enter the cell and get converted to acetylcoenzyme A through pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's actually a complex as well. So there are other videos on that. But if we have an increase of lactate dehydrogenase, that pyruvate gets converted to lactate. Now there's things that can actually induce lactate dehydrogenase. One of them is hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. And we already know that succinate can positively stimulate hypoxia inducible factor one alpha, which increases the activity of lactate dehydrogenase, which increases its conversion of pyruvate to lactate, leaving less pyruvate to enter the mitochondria to become acetyl coenzyme A. 
Why is that important? Well, in order to fully activate the electron transport chain for the full access of ATP, we need to convert pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A so that it can enter the Krebs cycle, get spun through the Krebs cycle, and then transfer over into the different complexes for the eventual production of ATP. That's at least with regards to glucose metabolism. It's interesting in that melatonin, this actually comes from an article called Melatonin and Mitochondria Mitigating Clear and Present Dangers by Dr. Russell Ryder and others. And it talks about how cellular melatonin inhibits hypoxia-inducible 1-alpha, uh, how melatonin actually improves activity of the different complexes of the electron transport chain. And what it does in one of the mechanisms is it has an inhibitory effect on something called pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which actually puts the brakes on pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So the end result is that melatonin within our cells could buffer to some degree against elevated succinate potentially in a chronic state. So one of the things to consider therapeutically is in anybody who may have an elevated succinic acid, even though you may not necessarily know all the reasons why it's happening, there may be some therapeutic benefit of administering some melatonin in those particular cases. And the same could be said of just antioxidant therapy, etc. So some of this information actually comes from our mitochondria mastery course which is one of the courses that is offered through Integrated Medicine Academy. Very in-depth course, very interesting. We go into great detail into mitochondrial biochemistry and then look at things from a clinical standpoint, disease standpoint, laboratory standpoint, intervention standpoint, etc. For more information, you can go to mitochondriamasterycourse.com. If you are interested in other courses that we offer through Integrated Medicine Academy, Again, go to integratedmedicineacademy.com or you can email us at integratedmedicineacademy at gmail.com. Again, I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. Thank you.